Let's give a warm Marxist school of Sacramento welcome to Joseph Matthews. Thanks very much for inviting me, for having me. Um, I'm going to turn over the uh, introductory because I don't want to look at my own face the whole time. Uh, so yes, this is a novel. But novels are capacious forms and they are able to include all kinds of subjects. Uh, the literary world is unfortunately a little bit afraid of politics. Uh, there aren't nearly enough novels that take politics as at their center, uh, but this one does. Uh, it's based on the story of a young Polish German Jew, a teenager who was forced to flee Hanover, Germany in 1936, wound up on his own in Paris uh, and lived on the streets of Paris uh, without documents, without papers, trying to get papers as a refugee, as he should have been awarded those papers, but was never given those papers until in the fall of 1938, his parents and brother and sister, along with all other people living in Germany holding Polish passports, 95% of whom were Jews, were rounded up one night and sent in locked train cars to the Polish border and dumped there. Uh, two days later, this young boy in Paris, Herschel, bought a gun, walked into the German embassy and shot dead a German consular official. Three days later, the Nazis used this as the excuse for Kristallnacht, Kristallnacht, the first nationwide pogrom in Germany against Jewish shops, homes, people, synagogues, the night of broken glass. Uh, we know after the fact that, of course, the Nazis had planned this for a long time and only used Herschel's shooting of the consular official as an excuse but he and everyone else at the time believed that this was in fact a spontaneous re response by the German people to his act in Paris. So while he languished for the next number of years in prison, he believed that he was, or his act was in fact the cause of Kristallnacht, which was an, an enormous burden on him. Um, the story uh, is told in letters by Herschel. Uh, after the shooting, by the way, he sat there calmly and waited to be arrested. Spent the next almost two years in prison in Paris waiting for a trial that never happened. Uh, when <coughs> the, the, the Wehrmacht, uh, the German army, approached Paris in June of 1940, he, along with a number of other political and other special prisoners were moved from jails in Paris and sent south first to to Chateau to Orléans, then Bourges, and finally they scattered along with the millions of other French as well as Belgians and Dutch who were fleeing across the French countryside. Herschel winds up all the way in the south of France on his own in Toulouse and turns himself in to the prison in Toulouse looking for protection in some way because being on the roads as a German-speaking boy on his own meant that he was subject to capture by the Gestapo, by the French who were uh, taking matters into their own hands against anyone they believed was German. Um, and two weeks after he turned himself in to Toulouse, to the prison, they turned him over to the Gestapo. He was then flown to Berlin, where the Nazis planned a huge international show trial for Herschel. We're still talking about the facts on which this novel is based. These are the historical facts. Uh, where they were going to invite the international press to put on a show trial to prove that the Germans had not wanted war with France, but they were driven to it by a cabal of uh, communists 
Jews and big capitalists. How the communists and big capitalists go together was something that the Nazis were going to skim over, but that was the plan, and they actually scripted an entire trial for her show, and it was going to be a big event. So this book is written in the form of letters, in Herschel's own voice, letters from German prisons and concentration camps where he was kept while he was awaiting this big show trial, describing letters to his appointed German lawyer, describing the whole history of his life from the time he left Hanover at, at 15 uh, through his years in Paris, most of it dealing with his years in Paris, and then his flight south, uh, and then uh, a little bit of flashbacks to his time growing up in Germany. So th these are the outlines, um, but what's the, what's the novel about other than the historical facts? Well, novels allow a writer to discuss in ways that most nonfiction can't the relationship between the personal and the political, the personal and the cultural, the personal and the societal. They allow you to examine very closely a character and a character's life in relation to political and social and cultural issues that nonfiction histories can't do. Uh, in this case, uh, the ways in which refugees are treated, were treated then, and of course, we're seeing this all over again in Europe now, um, the flight of refugees, but then little is said about the plight of refugees once they reach uh, a destination. This is a book about the plight of refugees, how do refugees live in a particular moment, in a particular political situation, which was Paris in the late 1930s. And it discusses the ways in which the politics of that time, place, the questions of identity, who's a real Frenchman, who's a real German, uh, affected the lives of refugees, uh, the way in which class affects the fate of some refugees versus other refugees. Uh, all of these things are the, the pith, the insides of this novel. Um, and one of the things, too, is the relationship th that I examine in the novel is the relationship of the left in Paris toward refugees in the late 30s. Uh, was not necessarily a pretty picture uh, in terms particularly of the official left of the Communist Party um, and the difficulty with which uh, the left dealt with uh, the plight of refugees, no, quote, non-French refugees, as well as refugees who had come earlier, this whole question of how the left dealt with its own nationalist instincts is another big part of the book. And one of the sections that I will read for you tonight will be part of the exploration of that, uh, that interchange between uh, the left, the official left, and refugees uh, in that moment. Uh, so the novel, through these letters, uh, attempts to describe what life was like for someone who lived these events. Uh, it's an attempt to give this historical character a voice. It's in his voice. So um, that's, that's the outline. Uh, what I'm going to read to you first is a brief is uh, one of the letters from very early on, one of Herschel's very first letters, where he's in being held in Gestapo headquarters in Berlin, October 1940, and he's just beginning to figure out how to tell his story, what kind of voice to use. Uh, he's writing in German. Uh, he hasn't used his German since he left school several years before, four years before. His, his language at home was Yiddish. He's been speaking French as well as German and Yiddish in Paris. And he's also very unsure of who this lawyer is to whom he's writing these letters because he's just met him and he doesn't really know what the relationship is and who this guy is. His name is Rosenhaus, the, the lawyer. 
Uh, he calls him Maitre, which M-A-I-T-R-E, which is the French honorific for a lawyer because when he was in French jails for two years, he had lawyers there and he got used to calling them Maitre. So he continues is to that use that. anybody would say to a lawyer? Or just exactly. No, anyone would say to a lawyer, to a barrister, a courtroom lawyer, you would call him Maitre. Um, in the story, there are a couple of things you need to know. There is an aunt and uncle that are referred to. He had, Herschel had an aunt and uncle who were already immigrants who were already living in Paris, eking out a living as tailors, uh, and they helped him a little bit. They were the only ones who helped him in Paris. He could sleep on their floor from time to time. They would give him a little money, although they had almost none. They would give him a meal now and again. Uh, Paris East is referred to, those are the neighborhoods of Belleville, Bastille, the Marais. This is where all the refugees were crammed into Paris, into Paris East. There's a reference to the defense committee. Uh, after the event, after the shooting, all of France, the left, the right, uh, trade unions, and all of the Jewish organizations turned their backs on Herschel. But remarkably, a defense committee was formed for him in the U.S. Um, by some liberal and left people in journalism and entertainment. Uh, and they raised quite a bit of money and hired very big-time powerful lawyers for him in Paris to defend him. So that's the defense committee that he refers to. And finally, there is a conference in the spa town of Evian. So the Evian conference is referred to. Um, very much like the conferences that are now being called in Europe to deal with the refugees. And I think the description of what happens at the Evian conference, you'll see, is probably what is happening right now in Europe with the refugee conferences. So, this first early letter, the date is 29 October 1940. Metra Herr Rosenhaus. It is now some time in the morning. I know because the guards just gave me bread, which they do each morning. I slept for a bit before that, though I have no way of knowing what time I stopped writing last night, or how long after that I fell asleep. I feel not at all well. My stomach is in confusion again. My back and neck also, they ache from the position I was in for so long while writing, sitting on the stone, the floor. Remember, he's in a jail cell in the Gestapo headquarters. But I woke this morning thinking about that September, two years ago, Metra, and I want to keep it in my mind, the thread of it. So I will push on with the writing, though most of me just wants to lie down again. There was a bit of hope during the summer before that September. He's talking about 1938. They cleaned the river, pulled out the bodies, which made the city seem less grim. And somehow, I do not know how else to describe it, Metra, less congested. Also, there was to be Evian, the conference there about us refugees, a hope that something would be done. A wasteful emotion, hope. The year had begun badly. In January, I had gone to the German consulate for a visa. I had a Polish passport, as I told you. A visa to go home to Hanover. Yes, back to Germany in 1938. Does that tell you something, Metra, about my life in Paris? I suppose it will come as no surprise to you that the Reich did not allow me to return. Paris became even more crowded that winter and spring, in the east of the city, anyway. More people who had fled from, from pogroms in Romania, and then Anschluss that March, the Austrians' turn. This time, though, the congrega congregations of the upper-type Paris families stood up. After all, these were civilized refugees, the Viennese, almost like Parisians. So they gathered in their drawing rooms and in their country houses, these old-time Paris families, to decide how to support their business associates 
and ski holiday friends from Vienna. And support them they did, sort of, by going to their synagogues and offering prayers, though only in Hebrew, so the France journals could not quote them. And the rest of Paris, yes, a few spoke of asylum for some, some of the Austrians, but not many, and not for others, not for anyone from the East, not for me. Anyway, none of them needed worry, the French, because the République, the France state, had its decrees, a flood of them that spring and summer. Decree, no new entries into France. Decree, no extending of residence permits. Decree, no more work permits. Decree, anyone with wrong or expired documents to be jailed, then thrown out from the country. And if caught again, three years in prison, and then thrown out. Plus the numerous clauses. Strange how a person learns things, Metra, Latin now on top of French. Numerous clauses for all the trades, even if you had a proper work permit. I knew a boy, Izali. He had some work now and then in a balalaika orchestra, just enough to keep him and his family alive. Fifteen years old and the only one in his family who had work. A wonderful musician, Izali, but with a Russian passport. Then came a numerous clauses that spring, no more than 10% of not French people in any music group. So they turned him out for being Russian in a Russian orchestra. And then his family had nothing. Months later, he finally found other work, this boy, in a clandestin, the, Par the Parisians call it, a hidden bordello, above a hairdressing shop, Rue Saint-Denis, a specialty bordel, Metra. He was not playing music there. Fiche, permits, even just to be a zamler, a scavenger, France law said you must have a fiche. In France, you need a fiche to sneeze. But that spring, there were no more fish given out by decree. And if you were caught selling something, anything, without a fish, and a refugee, straight to jail, then deporting. Even if you had a residence card, because the right to reside was not the same thing as the right to stay alive. And if you tried to stay alive by working, you lost your right to reside. Whatever the question, the answer was no. And by another new decree, the employers also could now be the employers also could now be heavily fined, depending on how French they were, of course, if they hired a worker who did not have the right papers. So suddenly, the peace workers in the worksheds and ateliers all over Paris were being turned out of their jobs. Also, thousands of new deporting orders. You done? Okay. All right. So suddenly the peace workers in the worksheds and ateliers all over Paris were being turned out of their jobs. Also, thousands of new deporting orders and more arrests every day. Many people went into hiding and worse. The boy Sam that I knew, he had a friend, Eli. Sam showed him to me that spring, floating in the river. His body stuck between two barges. Somehow his cap still gripped in his hand. After a winter on the streets, sometimes starving, sometimes freezing, he had found work, Eli, in a leather-making place, tanning hides over by La Villette, the slaughterhouses there. Two weeks later, there was another decree. I cannot remember which one now. And the leather workshop put him out. The next day, he jumped into the Seine. Not the only one, Metra. Some of them just floated away and we never saw them again. But many, like Eli, got caught on branches growing from the banks or on boat lines and washed back and forth, half sinking, surfacing, up and down, over and over. 
Whenever I passed by the river, I tried not to look down. But the summer, I was going to tell you about the summer, the hopeful summer. They cleaned the Seine. Tourists would be coming, and King George, the England king. July he would visit, and they worked hard to prepare the city. He was to ride down the river with a flotilla of boats. It was to be at the other end of Paris, the west, where the great World's Fair had been the year before. But they cleaned the river through the whole city, east past Gard Austerlitz, all the way to Bercy. There was so much cleaning that even a few people I knew got work. Some French workers would find foreigners and pay them, a tiny piece of their own wages, to do the foulest of the cleaning jobs. Fraternité or égalité, I am not certain which that was. But it was work, and people in Paris East were desperate for it. I knew a man doing this cleaning. He pulled his brother out of the river. The body, I mean. There were many rumors of how many bodies in all were found. I will not bother you with the different numbers, Metra. Still, somehow, a lot of us got caught up in the excitement of the England King's visit. It is difficult now for me to remember why. I suppose it was part of an idea that in some way England and France would come together about the Reich and about us refugees. Of course, in the autumn, in some way, they did come together. Munich. But in June and July, there was still hope. And somehow, the King's visit must have seemed a part of that. I know I plan to be there along the river to watch it all when he sailed by that July. In people's heads, I think, at least in mine, the king's visit was connected with Evian, the conference that was held around the same time, called together by President Roosevelt. Did you know that I had correspondence with him, the president? But that was later, from jail. Well, not exactly correspondence, but a letter I sent to him which the committee for me in America, the Defense Fund, they wrote me that they would make sure the president received it. Did I tell you about this committee, Metra? Famous people? Yes, I did. Edward G. Robinson, Little Caesar, I remember. So this letter, it asked the president for visas to the USA for my family. I asked nothing for myself. My trial in Paris had to proceed, I knew. I was responsible, and it would allow me to speak to the world about what was truly going on. The trial in Paris, which, as you know, never happened. Evian and President Roosevelt to help us refugees. Was there much notice of this conference in Germany, Metra? I can tell you there was in Paris, at least in the East. Many nations sent their topmost ministers to Evian where they talked long and hard about people like me. For a whole week it went on, every day the newspapers guessing what was happening behind the doors of the grand old spa hotel where they were meeting. I remember wondering whether they were all sitting in the baths together, dozens of naked old men talking about us as they soaked. Anyway, in the end, these great ministers produced a long statement of their intendings to help. The newspapers printed big headlines, all of which seemed to use the word commitment, and a photograph of all the politicians standing together, relieved, finished. We carefully read through this statement, my aunt and uncle and I, the other people I knew, everyone, full of promises to keep talking. We read it over and over again in different languages throughout Paris East, everyone arguing about the words, what this might mean or that, for two or three days, looking for the flame inside the smoke, until finally, one by one, we all stopped. It was the photos that made me angriest, their satisfied faces, and that word, commitment, Do not piss on my back and then tell me it is raining. A Yiddish expression, Metra. Those days we could all smell the piss. Excuse my language. Oh yes, and King George, he did come to Paris a few days later. 
and rode down the Seine, I did not bother to watch. The same day as the king's visit, the France ministries rejected my application for a residence permit. They even refused me an identity card, which meant I was no one. A month later, in early August, they issued an expelling order. It gave me four days to get out of France. Yours most truly, Herschel Greenspun. So that was an early letter where he's starting to lay out the history of his time in Paris. Um, He starts, moves back and forth, covering the period of time he tried to get out of Germany, tried to go to Palestine, but was rejected by Zionist groups because he was small, slight, a little bit sickly. They didn't want him. What year were those letters written? 1940. So he's in jail in Germ- in Berlin at this point. War. The war was the war was already had already been going on since thirty nine, and the invasion of France was in June May and June nineteen forty. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so I. Tessa. Yes. I have a sure. I have one, one question. Um, the letter. Is, is this your interpretation? Neither. These letters are all entirely written by me, made up by me. We have no letters from... Oh, there, okay. there are a couple of letters to his lawyers that exist in the historical record so that I was able to see a little bit of his language. In German, of course, he wrote them. Right. Um, but these were very formal, stilted letters and didn't really give you... And what one of the things that was most important to me about this book was to give this historical character a voice. And the way I wound up doing it was to create letters where he could be, he could be using his own voice in the letters. That's very effective. Yes. Thank, yes. You. Thank you. And you know German well enough? No, I'm making up the letters. No, I know that. Uh, I know that you read, read his, germ, his letters in the original German. In the, in the, oh, well, that could, they were only a few, so I got them translated. I read French, and so a lot of the history about his case is in French because it yeah, took sure. place, most of it took place in Paris. So I read the French, and when there were German documents, my wife, some other people, I had translate the German. So... Um, there are probably lots more documents buried in the Nazis' files in Potsdam, but they haven't emerged as yet. Um, so he was yeah. intending to plead guilty? Well, he wasn't intending to plead guilty. He, he wanted to stand trial. He wanted a trial because he wanted to explain why he did the shooting to, to talk about his parents, the deportation of his parents and the 12,000 other Poles who, who were deported along with him. So this was his chance to speak to the world. And he imagined that this shooting would be a way of drawing attention to the situation. It gets more complicated as he spends years in um, German prisons. And, you know, I hope you'll read the book and you'll see that towards the end he starts to understand finally that his idea of what he's going to get a chance to say at this trial and what the Nazis will permit him become very different things, and then that plays itself out in a peculiar way. Um, I won't, I won't spoil that for you, but his original idea was always either in France or in Germany. He wanted to stand trial and so wanted to cooperate with this lawyer who was appointed. And we do know, in fact, that a lawyer was appointed for him. Um, so. The idea was to explain himself, and and the lawyer was asking him to write these to, quote, prepare for the trial. Now, we know after the fact that the Nazis had no intention of really letting him say very much, but he believed he did. And so this is my attempt to create these letters giving him a voice uh, using the device of writing to this lawyer. So, one of the things that was going on in Paris in the late 30s was roiling streets of politics. There was the Popular Front, as you know, in 1936 and 37 with Leon Blum, nominally at least a socialist, a member of the Socialist Party as president of the Republic. Um, And uh, the Communist Party, actually part of the government during the Popular Front, um, left 
Unions were enormously powerful, but they were also fractured among anarchists and non-party member leftists and syndicalists, all kinds of things going on. They were also, the left was also in pitched battles with the right because unions in France also included uh, Catholic unions, which were very, very conservative right wing. Uh, so the next section I'm going to write to you, uh, there was a, the World's Fair was being put on in 1937 in Paris, um, and there was a tremendous amount of work for labor unions uh, building the World's Fair, and there were enormous battles over who was going to get this work among the different unions. Uh, and there was even work for undocumented refugees. There was also a middle ground of refugees, people who had residence permits, who had come in the previous decade or so, uh, and many of whom had work permits, but the French unions were closed to them because they were not considered French enough. Uh, and these workers with work permits, most of them, formed what were called foreign sections. And they were by nationality, uh, so there would be a Polish foreign section and a Russian foreign section, a Lithuanian foreign section, and each of them connected itself to uh, one of the, either the labor unions or more commonly the big labor confederations. We have, you know, have had the AFL and the CIO. In France there are, are now still, and have been since uh, the turn of the 20th century, uh, big labor confederations which have connections to political parties on one hand and have unions under them connected to them from below. Uh, very, very politically powerful groups, the most powerful of which is the CGT, still the largest uh, labor confederation uh, in France. And during the time of the Popular Front, um, the Communist Party was a part of the CGT. Communist unions were, as were other uh, non-Communist Party left unions, um, in a very large confederation with enormous power. So I'm going to read a little bit about a section about how this relationship between the foreign sections, the party, and uh, immigrant workers played itself out uh, around the, the Exposition Universelle, which is the World's Fair, the CGT, the largest labor confederation, um, and these foreign sections. Um, let's see, what else do, do you need to know? Um, so they, these foreign sections were attached to and supported by the CGT, the biggest uh, confederation, and uh, the, communist, the official Communist Party until the summer of 1937 when the party did an about-face and uh, dumped uh, the foreign sections as part of their turn against immigrants. Um, the other character besides Herschel in this piece is a young friend of his named Henri, a little bit older, a Paris-born organizer of a for foreign section connected to the CGT. Um, he has befriended Herschel and helped him get some under-the-table work. He helps him get under-the-table work at the World's Fair and then later at the Citroën factory in Javel, um, later in the story. Uh, and they speak to each other. It doesn't come up too much in here, but they speak to each other in a very funny combination of Henri's very poor Yiddish and Herschel's very poor French. So they figure out a way to talk to each other, which earlier in the book has some funny things happening. So, <clears throat> Maitre. I went looking for my friend Henri, who had been so positive, so promising about the possibility of work. I headed to the address Henri had given me for his foreign section on a small street near the Gare de Lyon train station, not far south of Bastille. I found the place easily enough, a little storefront with three or four people busy inside, but no Henri. The people there said that I could most likely find him at their larger bureau, that Henri was now there most days over near the Citroën factory at Javel on the river in the southwest corner of the city. 
But walking all the way to this other bureau was not something I was willing for. It was across the whole width of the city, and an unhappy rain had already soaked me on my much shorter walk to this closer foreign section bureau in the east. I had just bought secondhand one of those flat caps that Henri and his worker friends all wore, and this was my first time to use it. But somehow I could not manage to fit it on correctly. It kept shifting around, and in the end did not keep much rain off my head and neck. I could have gone down into the metro, the underground tram, but I was still not used to using it, and anyway, the bus cost less. Less. So I crossed the river to the nearby Gardoster Litz, knowing that many buses depart from outside the train stations. It was so calm and orderly that day, the station. Nothing like the chaos and misery I would see there three years later, my last ever view of Paris. That was during the German invasion of Paris when he was moved south and they left from the same train station along with tens of thousands of panicked Parisians trying to get out. Outside the station I found a bus that went to the Tour Eiffel, which I had never seen up close but now realized from a map at the bus stop was not far from where I was heading. I watched as best I could out the steamy bus window as we traveled through the rain past the edge of the French student area down the long crowded bustle of Boulevard Montparnasse, and finally out onto a road that runs beside the Champ de Mar, a huge rectangle of fields and gardens that starts at the Tour Eiffel and stretches a kilometer or so in from the river. At the time, though, none of the gardens were left there, no green of any kind. Instead, it looked like a small city inside of Paris, but somehow completely separate from it, and which was recovering from a war or a giant earthquake that had magically stayed only and exactly within its boundaries. There were enormous piles of stone and brick and lumber and dirt and machinery and half-built buildings of every size and shape all over the huge place. Only a few of them finished, including two towering cement block monuments just on the other side of the river, each with giant statues on top, facing off like guard dogs on chains, straining to get at each other. This was the, these were the Soviet and Nazi pavilions, which they had funded and were built facing each other across extraordinary massive buildings, and they were built very, finished very early. <clears throat> they were separated, these two massive buildings, by an open space that led up to a huge, wide, Roman sort of palace on a hill overlooking the construction and river below. There was scaffolding everywhere, red flags hanging from some of it, and thousands of people, most of them doing constructing, but some just marching around outside particular building sites where there seemed to be no work going on. All of this in the endless dreary rain, which more than anything else left me with an impression of the place as a sea of mud, everywhere mud. This was to be a main section of the World's Fair Metro, scheduled to open in just a few weeks, but seeming, as I, as I passed by it on the bus, more likely by then to have sunk into the Seine. The bus stopped next to the famous tower, and I got off and started walking south along the river. After a few minutes, I found the Foreign Section Bureau. It was bigger, two large connecting rooms, and much busier than the one on the east side of the city, with groups of men in worker clothes and a few groups of women scattered around the place talking with each other and looking at paperwork and newspapers. I spotted Henri as soon as I reached the doorway. He was in an agitating conversation, his hands darting around in front of him in a way that did not seem very French to me, with three other men, but he saw me almost immediately and waved me in as he went on with his jabbering. I stood just to their side <clears throat> side for a few minutes while they continued their argument, but they were speaking so fast and with so much slang that I had no idea what they were talking about in French. And of course, Herschel's French is not very good still. Finally, they seemed to agree on something. The little group broke up and Henri took me over to a quieter corner of the room. Oh, I should have mentioned... Um, when applying for, uh, Herschel went with his aunt and uncle to apply for papers 
residence papers as a refugee because he qualified as a refugee um, at the great central police bureau early in his after his arrival in Paris um, but all they did was give him um, a receipt that said that he had applied uh, and nothing else and he waited for two years and ultimately never got his papers and was told to leave, uh, gave, given four days to leave. But at this point, he's now just gotten one, the least significant piece of paper you can possibly have, this receipt. But to him, it was the first official paper he had. Before either of us said anything, I pulled from my pocket the receipt the police had given me, showing that I was properly registered in the country now, and handed it to him. I could not help grinning. Henri looked at it for a moment and nodded, but said only good and handed it back to me. What did good mean? I stopped grinning. He was glad to see me, he said, and told me I had come at the right moment. Action. That was his single word of explaining this moment, pronounced in a way that let you hear all the letters, both separately and together, and the saying of it almost lifting him off the ground. Action. He gestured with his head for me to look around the room at all the busy people, then told me a bit of what was going on. This bureau had been set up there several years before, Henri said, because of the big Citroën factory down the road and the huge Renault works just across the river in boulogne billancourt and other factories also nearby. All the big industrial guilds and syndicates also had bureaus near there. Most of the foreign sections were now connected with the CGT, the biggest labor confederation of them all. And over the last two years or so, especially since the beginning of constructing on the World's Fair, things had been moving heavy and fast. <coughs> there was organizing and strikes and other action at the giant auto factories, not to mention battles there between different syndicates, and also lots of new work at the Expo, with many work stoppages and strikes and such there also. In fact, Henri said, he and several of his comrades, I remember being impressed with the word, the way he used it so ordinary. They were about to head up to the expo to look in on one of the building sites to see whether there was any extra work today for people from his foreign section. Did I want to go? Eight or ten of us walked in the direction I had just come from. Despite the break from the rain, the few men who were not already wearing their flat caps immediately put them on when we stepped outside. I had earlier stuffed my own unfitting cap into my back trousers pocket under my jacket. I left it there. Up close, the expo site looked even more of a mess than when I had passed it on the bus. We picked our way through the mud past crowds of dirt caked workers and machines around piles of materials and the skeletons of buildings. In the half-built jumble, it seemed almost impossible to know one place, one building site from another. There must have been a hundred of them. But as Henri and his friends moved steadily forward, he would sometimes point out a particular shell and tell me what it was to become. The Al Alsace Pavilion, the Hall of Rail Travel Pavilion, that sort of thing. And the particular syndicates that were working on it, though some names meant nothing to me. We finally reached the far side of the Champ de Mar, then moved beyond it to another area along the Seine where Expo buildings were also going up. We stopped at a site that backed onto the river, a building that seemed almost finished and that had more workers with more activity than any of the others we passed. Red flags flew from the building scaffolding and most of the workers had red kerchiefs around their necks, meaning they were part of the party. Henri explained that this was the hall of work dedicated to the laborers of France themselves and that although it had been approved and funded only recently, it was further along than most other sites and would be ready, unlike most of the buildings, for the expo opening the following month. That, he said, hunching himself up to his full height, was because only CGT members were allowed to work on this building. We rocked, walked around to the other side where Henri spoke with one of the workers. Just then there was a commotion behind us, 20 meters or so out away from the building, with two or three red kerchief workers arguing, yelling, cursing at several other workers who were giving it back just as strong. 
The groups are standing on two different temporary wooden walkways they each were constructing to give safe passage across the mud, one out from the hall of work and the other coming from another building site across the way, both aimed toward a more permanent cement pathway. The two temporary walkways were headed to cross paths in the middle of the open space and apparently neither group intended to give way. Now several other men joined in from the other side and were quickly matched by men from the hall of work. Suddenly several of the men were fighting and others from each side rushed in, swinging and kicking. It was wild and ugly and frightening, the men breaking through the makeshift wooden handrails of each other's walkway, crashing into the boards and wrestling into the mud. More men rushed from the hall of work into the fight, which now took up much of the space between the two building sites. I do not remember how or where I got it from, Metra, but when I felt Henri pulling me back towards the hall of work, I realized that I had a large piece of wood in my hand and had been wading out in the mud toward the fight. Henri took me back to the edge of the pavilion and from that safer distance we watched for a minute as the fight carried on, other men pouring in from neighboring sites. After a few minutes the battle slowed and eventually stopped with the fighters retreating to their own sides. Henri looked down at the wood I was still gripping tightly and I threw it aside. He said nothing but a quick smile sneaked across his face. Henri now led me away from the trouble and out of the expo. We found a small bar a few blocks away after Henri had passed up several other places. Too fancy, he said, of two cafes, looking in at well-dressed customers. Too catholique, he said, of another bar, somehow able to recognize that the men in work clothes who filled that particular place were not of his liking. At a corner table at the place where we finally settled, Henri gave me sort of a word map of the expo and of what had just happened there. It seemed to me a very long story, though I suppose it was actually a very short version. So I'll just have uh, two more pages to read, but uh, the end of which is the reference to... um, Henri's foreign section being cut off by the party later in the summer. All of the arguments of Paris were jammed together at the expo. The way Henri explained it, the expo sounded like a giant laboratory where the scientists were all competing against each other but had to use the same test tubes. When the expo construction had been planned several years before, Henri said, The business people of Paris had all been strongly behind it. The government and other countries also, for each one's own pavilion, would spend incredible amounts of money. The companies in charge of constructing the different expo sites would be hugely paid, and many of the other businesses of Paris would make millions from the people who came to visit during the half year the expo was to be open. The workers, on the other hand, were not all of the same mind about it not all of the same mind about much of anything, Henri said. There were dozens of different guilds and syndicates in Paris, not just depending on the jobs they did, metal workers, constructing workers, electric workers, and so forth, but also larger worker groups, confederations they were called, that the individual syndicates were part of. And each confederation was connected with a political group, left parties, right parties, more left, more right. They were so big, some of these confederations, they were political movements all by themselves. I hope I am making sense to you about all this, Metra. I cannot recall the details of what Henri told me that day or of other bits and pieces I heard over the following few months. And to be honest, I did not understand it very well even at the time. Please excuse me for speaking about things I do not know well, but they are part of what happened to Henri during that spring and summer of 1937. And so, in the end, what happened to me. At the start of constructing the expo, there were several worker groups who were quite happy with things. These were the Syndicat Catholique, Henri called them, though he never explained to me exactly why. I mean, All the real French are Catholic, as far as I could tell, so? 
Anyway, these Syndicat Catholiques seem to get along very well with the employers, and so we're happy to have all the expo work with no questions asked. But many of the other, other syndicates, the ones connected to the left parties, were not so keen. They were in the middle of long struggles with the employers, and though, of course, they were tempted by all the work that building the expo could offer, they did not want to give up their bigger fight with the employers. Also, many of them were furious that in the middle of the terrible Great Depression, the government was spending so much on what Henri called a giant circus. So the confederation that Henri's foreign section was connected to became part of a larger one, the CGT, along with other left confederations and syndicates whose initials I cannot give you because I could not ever keep them straight. And for the past year, Henri said, they had taken their fight against the employers onto the expo grounds, where they led many slowdowns and strikes and occupations. Also, combat with the Syndicat Catholique. That brawl Henri and I had just come from in the mud outside the hall of work? About nothing and everything. Left workers and Catholics going at each other once again. Yes, and also communists, Metra. Part of Henri's confederation, confederation. How many times when I was in the Paris jail and then at the Gestapo, though thinking back on it, not nearly as often from them as from the French, was I asked, and what about the communists? As if, in the end, the answer to that question must be the answer to everything. Well, yes, the CGT now had official communists in it, Henri told me, but also socialists and anarchists and syndical anarchos and councilists, and I do not know what else. So? They were even in the France Chamber of Deputies, the communists. I mean, they were not some secret society, Metra. It is not as if they were Masons. So, was Henri a communist? I am sure you would ask me that next, Metra, if you were here. But I do not know. He never said. And I never asked. Never thought to ask. But the foreign sections, yes, it was the communist confederation they were connected to. For a while. After what happened later that summer, though, if Henri had himself been a communist, he certainly was not any longer, except perhaps somewhere deep in his broken heart. Thanks very much.